Great. Great. Right. Hello, my name is Nick Breeze and I'm based in London and we're hosting a call today for the United Planetary Faith and Science Initiative. And we've got Rachel Winner in Jerusalem and Dr. Mark Axelrod in America. Can, Dr. Axelrod, can you tell us a bit about um, your background in science and what you're working on, please? Sure. Um, I'm, I guess, trained in, in law and political science um, and I, I study and teach in the area of international environmental uh, policy and, and law and governance, um, and and that spans a, a wide scope of materials. So we don't need to talk about me though. <laughs> and you've you've looked. Am I right in saying that you've looked a lot at the human impact on ecosystems and sustainability of those ecosystems? And could you tell us a bit about that work? Sure. Um, uh, my, my interest is, is largely in um, trying to understand uh, some of the feedback between human and natural systems. Um, and uh, getting an idea of uh, how how people use resources and and how those um, how that affects uh, their future the resources sustainability uh, but also uh, people's livelihoods um, and and done that in a, a few different contexts um, to me one of the most interesting questions is when when faced with um, either ecological uh, systemic shocks um, or um, any other sort of uh, major changes, be it economic or political, um, how people respond um, to those changes um, and how that affects the environment in which they live. So you're, you're analyzing how, because these are quite complex systems, are they sort of e economics, people, um, I suppose agricultural, anything that is in there is quite complex. So you're trying to see how they, how they influence each other, is that right? Yeah, I mean, I think we all we all are both products of our environment and uh, have an effect on our environment. Um, whether we think of that environment as, as simply the uh, the house or the job we um, we sit in or attend every day, um, or whether we think of that as our natural surroundings, I think there's a lot of feedback between those. Because our other speaker, who should be coming online quite shortly, is um, uh, Savi Bhagavati, and she's based in India. And does a lot of work there. You, you're, you've also done a lot of work in India, haven't you? Yeah. Yes, I have. And could you tell us a bit about a project that you've been working on there in that region? Sure. Uh, the the project I'm I'm working on most right now in, in India um, is trying to understand how uh, how fishermen respond to global markets. Um, and uh, so one of the things we we see is that uh, you know, lots of people suggest global markets um, increase. Uh, resource access um, or, or resource use, um, and, and others suggest that it, global markets also can send um, signals about using resources more carefully. Um, so we're trying to understand, um, at least at the district and hopefully eventually at the village level, um, what factors uh, lead people to respond differently to those global market signals. So is that a we're talking slightly about the sort of financial how it's become integrated so right down at the fishermen's level how how that that fish becomes a product and is sold into a more of a global market context I mean is it your view that that, that this is working that it's a good it's a good system at the moment I mean what's well, your... so the, the, the interesting thing to me is that there's actually quite a few different systems um, and that provides us an opportunity to see which are working better and when I say better um, that means in terms of sustainability of the fishery, um, means in terms of, of livelihoods for people, um, means in terms of uh, fishermen getting a fair price for their products, um, yeah. and so forth. Um, so, uh, so, th so that's what we're, we're trying to understand is, is what it is that leads people to actually get these signals um, from the market. And, and one thing we see is in districts uh, where, um, where people have access to more uh, information technology, so uh, cell phones primarily, um, they're able to get that market information and then they're able to really bargain with the middlemen more. Um, in, in other districts uh, where people don't have as much access to information, um, we're finding um, that uh, people are less responsive to market signals. Um, and in some respects, um, there's a, a conflict there between um, the, the benefit to a livelihood um, of hearing those market signals and being able to sell at a higher price, um, but also having that as an incentive to fish more um, and go after uh, 
and deplete uh, more fish stocks. Um, but, but what we also see is that um, you know, if, if we um, look at what types of, uh, of policy um, influences are possible, um, a lot of, uh, th there, there are a lot of opportunities for uh, clear policies and clear uh, governance procedures uh, to mitigate some of the, the damage caused by um, increased fishing. Um, so for instance, um, while people may fish more, if they fish more um, and use a different type of nets, um, then they may be catching the shrimp that they need uh, to, to enhance their livelihoods, uh, but at the same time not having all kinds of other uh, fish uh, bycatch um, in their nets. Um, and so, so that, that, gives, that provides an opportunity to uh, enhance both livelihoods um, as well as ecosystems at the same time. And how, um, I'm just thinking, uh, the, the, you just talked about the sustainability of the, the fishing ecosystem, and how do, do, do they respond to shocks? I mean, if there's like a price price hike in, in the markets, and can they be driven by market forces as opposed to what's going on with the fishermen? I, I, it seems quite a, quite a complex um, relationship. So it, it seems to depend, um, and this is where uh, you know I said earlier um, we're doing research at the district level right now. Um, yeah. So that's comparing large groups of, of fishermen, of course. Um, we'd like to eventually be doing this more at the village uh, and even individual uh, level to understand what people's individual motivations are. Yeah. Um, it, a, a lot of a lot of fishermen are not connected enough to the market to really know um, that prices are going up or down. Um, okay. and, and frankly, even if they knew, they wouldn't have much bargaining power um, because uh, they fish on the basis of, uh, well, their, their boat is uh, loaned from somebody um, and they owe usually not money but, um, but a portion of their catch. Um, and so they don't really get a say in the, in the price if they're in that situation. Okay, that's interesting. Um, so, so yes, it, it, it's a really complex system. Um, so you're working, um, you're working with the fishermen, but you're not quite yet working with the on an individual basis. It's more um, at the sort of village or level. Yeah, so we're uh, we have we're working with uh, an institute, uh, fisheries research institute in India, um, that has collected data for a long time. So we're looking at those aggregate levels uh, okay. to try and understand what's going on, and then uh, we're we're hoping. Um, in the coming years to be doing interviews on the ground um, in villages. Um, we have, uh, there's uh, one grad student working with me who's uh, been actively talking to fishermen. Um, uh, and I, I should add, um, I, I, I continuously reference fishermen. Um, in this particular context, it's really only men who are um, doing the fishing. Um, so one of the interesting things about her research is she's trying to understand uh, when some of these changes, uh, be they policy changes or economic changes uh, or ecological changes, uh, the, the process of addressing uh, those changes or, or the effects of those changes um, is almost always dealt with at the level of how they affect people who are fishing um, because that's seen as the primary stakeholders. Uh, but there are quite a few other people, of course, who uh, depend on that, uh, on the fish. Uh, for their livelihoods, so the people who make nets, um, the people who sell the fish up the, the market chain, um, people at, at, uh, who uh, supply food to the fishermen when they come into port, um, and so, so on and so forth. Um, and those people um, are not all men, um, so there's, there's a substantial divide in terms of the effects of these things um, on individuals um, based on what, what sort of role they have um, in their village or in their society, and if if um, if the, there is pressure on the ecosystem, how how would um, I wouldn't expect the fishermen necessarily to be too aware, except in the maybe the the, the level of catch they're getting um, might decrease or something like that. But if you come up with a solution you analyze something and you think, well, you know, if you change your nets, then you can, like you say, exclude the, the by, byproduct or extra fish. And how do you implement those changes? How would yeah, you that's, that's really difficult because I think, I mean, there's uh, both a, 
both a fear but also a lot of evidence um, that uh, reducing bycatch may also uh, decrease the amount of, uh, of targeted catch. Um, and so uh, in a lot of communities, um, people are, are quite, uh, people are reticent to, to accept those types of changes, um, especially if they've been fishing with the same gear um, over uh, decades and maybe even generations. Yeah. Um, so uh, part of it is to figure out who actually foots that bill and provides those materials, um, which in, in most respects can't actually be the fishermen themselves. They, they don't have the resources to do that, at least at, at the starting point. Now perhaps um, if the market prices skyrocket and, and they're making more money, they would be more amenable to doing that. So is there a, um, a knowledge gap perhaps as to explaining why in the long run it is better for them to, to, to start looking at this, but also maybe looking at the chain to see who can help fund or put in these changes, because if the fishermen can't afford to do it themselves, then it's just extra. You know, I'm not. I'm not sure I would call that a knowledge gap, um, in the sense that um, it, they're different types of knowledge. Um, the fishermen have a lot of knowledge that the policymakers uh, don't have, um, or that and that we don't have. That's, I, I find I'm, I'm learning quite a bit from from speaking uh, and from you know, from the conversations that we've had with people. Um, who are um, engaged in fishing and, and related um, sectors. Um, so I, I think there's there's an understanding of the fishery, um, and we can think of that from a sort of Western scientific view, uh, but we can also think of that from uh, the perspective of somebody who's been fishing in those waters for uh, for decades and uh, you know and, and passed down through generations. Um, and what their understanding of the ecosystem is, um, and and so um, I would say every last person, um, you know, and, and not that we've interviewed every uh, fisherman on, on the coast of India, certainly, um, but everybody we've spoken to is uh, you know quite interested in the long-term sustainability of the fishery. Um, and, and perhaps coming at it from a, a, a different perspective um, than we do as man resource managers or policy makers. So you you found um, people quite receptive to, to your input or to your involvement when you're when you're out there communicating with people. Um, you mean in the sense of, of being willing to discuss uh, yeah. their situation yeah. and their experiences? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yes. That's people have been quite receptive to talking about it. I, obviously, we're we're not at the stage of this research where um, we've shared our findings and um, making any sort of recommendations at any level. Um, so I, I couldn't tell you how receptive people will, will be at that stage. Um, but but people are very eager to discuss their livelihoods and their experiences, um, and also to have to be able to share um, what they know about fish and the fishery. Okay, and, and would you say that there's um that they they see your the the work that you're doing, or I'm just trying to phrase it correctly. But they, do you think they see the work that you're doing as informing what they're doing in a in some way, or or is it something that they feel that they're more informing informing you because they've got such an intricate mm -hmm. knowledge of an ecosystem? Um, as there's a sort of I'm just wondering how they respond to it in the long term. Um, is it a, do they see it as a beneficial, um, like a collaboration or, or experience? That's a great question. I, I, I don't know. I guess we'll see in the long term. Um, like I said, at this point, I've certainly learned quite a bit from, um, from the people I've spoken to, and I, I hope that, um, you know, I, I guess I don't see myself as, giving information, but um, more in facilitating the dialogue. Um, and, and hopefully we can contribute in, in that respect to opening up some of uh, some of these dialogues and, and conversations about um, how to manage the fishery better for um, people who are facing a changing climate and changing market and so forth. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because if you get, if I walk down the road here and go into the supermarket, um, the food comes from all over, <laughs> all over the world. And so these are quite, and especially people here are 
always reading the packets now. Where does it come from? How is it made? You know, is it farmed? Is it this? Is it that? Um, I think that's a, a growing global obsession. So the work that you're doing is, is really valuable because it's giving a, it, it's opening up that that area that people are genuinely concerned with and want to know that farmers are, you know, not being ripped off by the people up the chain and that they're buying something that's perhaps, um, you know, uh, fair trade, I think, is, is one of the words that comes about. But, um, how do how do you do you see it in that context that it, there is a sort of a greater good that extrapolates out um, to to people at this end, so <laughs> the, the the consumer, uh, for want of a better word. Yeah, I think. Well, I, I suppose I mean, my own personal experience um, is thinking about these things in in the context of. Um, not so much the feedback to, to my ecosystem um, where I live, um, but, but thinking about um, doing things sustainably because it, it benefits a lot of people. Right? Yeah. People and, you know, and other species as well, but, um, but thinking about it in the context of, of long-term sustainability um, means thinking about um, what you buy or what you do and, and its effects on things. And, and it doesn't mean that um, people are going to make every decision um, with only um, yeah, ecological sustainability in mind. Um, we have lots of things that we, uh, we have lots of uh, reasons that we make the decisions we make. Um, but I think uh, being thoughtful about them is, is quite important and knowing um, the effects of any decision that we make is, is really important. And do you, do you find that when you're sort of you're not at work, say you're out socially and one of these issues comes up, say relating to food or anything like that, that you find that you can sort of talk about it in a way that people are like, wow, you know, that's actually quite interesting. Because just talking to you now, I'm sort of thinking, oh, this, this is quite a lot of stuff here I, I don't really know anything about, but it, I would like to know more about. Um, do you ever find that? Do people sort of ask you more questions and you're sort of not in your work mode? about how how these food ecosystems and how they feed into the market or how they how they're operating sure yeah absolutely I, I mean I think I don't know if that's a polite conversation um, or if that's actual interest um, but but certainly uh, people do ask follow-up questions when I explain what it is that I'm, I'm doing and working on and especially if I mentioned to somebody here I'm, I'm traveling to do some uh, to start a research project um, people will ask follow-up questions. Why are you going there? What's what's interesting about that particular place um, and time? And uh, you know, what's what's the goal of your research? So yeah, certainly I have those conversations. Yeah, good. Uh, I'm just wondering if, if it's something we discussed slightly before the call in um, terms of uh, extracting some of the, the these key points out of it and and sharing them because there seems to be so much value in the whole. Research, you know what you're doing, um, that yeah, it would be great to explore it in more depth. Um, as in, I mean, in real time, so that when you're when you are somewhere, you can you can like post the images or responses, or um, so that we you know, from these calls we can engage in them some more. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think that's a great idea. It's something that sort of falls by the wayside when. Um, when I dive headlong into you know, a short a short research trip and trying to accomplish everything at once, but um, I think you're right that documenting some of that experience uh, probably has some some long term value. I think so. I, I think it really brings this whole issue, the whole issue to life in terms of um, you know how these how we food arrives in my supermarket. It just makes you think about you know sustainability and. These are the key issues that we want to discuss in these talks. Um, Rachel, have you had any thoughts? Are you still there? Can you hear? I'm here. I was muted. Um, I, yeah, I'm just really interested in, in how we can um, communicate these trends to the public if um, they're not under some sort of formal certification. Like you had mentioned fair trade certification a while ago and our previous conversation about um, sort of marketing this information to, like, this uh, scientific information to the public. 
Um, just wanted to sort of pull those two pieces together to um, bring this information to um, like the general market, I guess. Uh, that's, I, I think. Well, I, I think uh, you know, lots of media sources, sort of uh, traditional media sources, even do this well. The, um, the Guardian newspaper has been doing a series on um, uh, the on, on labor um, that captures uh, labor used to capture shrimp, um, particularly in the the Thai market, um, but but more generally around the world. Um, and and so I think. I think that's a good example. Obviously, the Guardian has a, a platform that not all of us have available. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and in terms of what you can and, and don't want to say at a certain time, because it's something you haven't published it in the journals, you obviously don't want to be plastering it all over <laughs> blog sites. But um, you, I suppose you can talk about the objectives of the research. Is that, is that correct? Right, and at this stage, that's all I have. Right? I don't yeah. have any evidence, and I'm, I guess I'm I'm loath to. So, so the particular the correlation that I mentioned before that um, districts with cell phone access um, tend to fish more um, in response or tend to increase their fishing more in response to global market signals. Um, yeah. That's not published, but it is. I do feel comfortable that the evidence is there. We've collected and analyzed the evidence um, at this stage, um, but certainly. Uh, when you talk about um, sharing materials throughout the research process, um, I'm a little more careful um, when I don't have um, specific evidence to share yet. Um, we certainly have hypotheses to share, but um, yeah. I think that's good. Uh, that makes perfect sense. But uh, just on another level, then, and when you find your research, if you get your data, your and findings, um, Will they be used to form policy, or will they be to advise policy, or would they, um, or would it be a more hands-on approach of trying to educate people directly? Say it might be the fishermen. You come up with some findings that they could make some changes that are beneficial to the environment or whatever. Um, would you be looking to engage with them directly, or through policy and governance, or, or both? I mean, I think that's that's up to what what people want, um, and and certainly at the at the front end of any research project, um, I try at least to have contact with the people who would be affected by those by the the results of the research. Yeah. Um, that's that's not always possible. Um, in this particular instance, um, we were able to talk to. Uh, various NGOs. We we weren't able to talk to individual fishermen in every village along the coast of India, of course, um, but but we were able to uh, speak with NGOs and uh, fisheries research institutes. So at that level, um, one of the NGOs we've worked with, uh, the MS Swaminathan uh, Research Foundation, um, is uh, is an implementing organization. They're not policy makers, um, and they really work with people uh, basically as an extension agent. Um, to help fishermen and, and other um, agricultural sectors um, to adapt to current conditions and future conditions. Um, so uh, they actually have a program to provide uh, mobile phones to people in, um, in fishing villages um, so that people can have access to information. But they haven't been using them for market information as much as for um, weather and uh, safety information. Okay. Uh, but but obviously there's multiple uses for those types of platforms. So that's more on the level of, of really looking at what what people can benefit from um, on an individual level. Um, obviously through this this NGO. Um, on the other hand, we're working with um, a government research institute um, that works with um, each of the state fisheries agencies. So at that level, we're talking more about the the policy implications. Um, now. I have to say I have no idea if anybody will be interested in the results of the research once it's done, um, but but that's the goal is to make it accessible um, yeah. to both of those types of groups. Okay. Um, what was I going to say? I've heard a lot about the the mobile phone um, being distributed amongst farmers and fishermen. Um, for, for quite a wide range of 
reasons, and it, it is a real direct sort of action, really, isn't it? It's a very positive thing, to power enabling. And, um, um, I suppose what I was driving with, with the last point as well was, was it, is there a, a, a sense of um, local people in, in these kinds of regions um, developing a, a, a I'd say a good feeling about why they're having to respond to the environment and and why it's becoming because it's it's important for everybody around the world no matter where you are and um, but when you meet these people are they, and they're working in with with nature in a way are they positive about having to to take this action or do they see it as a an inconvenience I, I think it's a key issue to look at how we can sort of engage you know discuss some of these issues because I think there's resistance all the way around the world to a lot of changes because they might affect livelihoods and things. Yeah, so I, I think people who have resource-based livelihoods, you know, fishermen or uh, people who collect produce from forest, forested areas um, have, have a, a deep connection to those uh, natural resources. And so I, I think in, in those situations, the, the, they're sort of the first line uh, of response saying, look, my, my resource has been degraded. Um, I, I know it's affecting my livelihood. Um, so that's, um, in, in speaking with individual fishermen, that's a lot of what we get is, I don't catch what I used to be able to catch. Um, it take, I have to spend more hours fishing in order to get the same amount of fish. Um, and and th that obviously raises um, some concerns. Um, now, in, in terms of what types of responses, um, uh, that depends on, on what types of responses are available, I suppose. Um, I, I don't know. I think that's, that's a good question. But, but certainly the consciousness of, um, of ecology and of the ecosystems and, and the resources themselves um, is, is there, especially for people in, in, um, in sectors that rely on natural resources. Yeah. It's interesting that they're, they're actually experiencing it and have they're like working case studies where they can say like you just said you know I'm, I'm fishing for a lot longer to get the same catch I did before that's a real um, example in their own lives so it probably makes them much more receptive for you doing research as to why and how maybe you know, they can be influenced in a positive way so that's my hope is that we're doing something that's useful for yeah. people yeah. okay um, given your personal experience and your knowledge of the environment, environmental situation we are facing, what knowledge and character traits do you think are most critical to bestow on our children's generation? Well, that's, a, that's quite a, a deep, uh, thoughtful question. Um, uh, Nick, yeah. Sorry? Can you repeat the question? You froze for a moment. Can you please repeat the question? Yeah, sure. It's uh, given your personal experience and your knowledge of the environmental situation we are facing, what knowledge and character traits do you think are most critical to bestow on our children's generation? So, uh, like I said, I, this, is a very, this is a very deep question. I, I think, you know, the uh, being thoughtful, being um, trying to get knowledge about what our decisions and behaviors entail and, and the effect of the things that we do. Um, to me, that's the most important thing. Like I said, we, we can't make every decision um, with only um, one outcome in mind, um, but certainly we should be making decisions. Mark, I'm going to um, stop you for a moment because uh, you're breaking up. So we're having oh, a really sorry. hard time hearing your response. Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. I can hear Mark perfectly. You can hear him clearly? Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. You're, you're, um, you're, go uh, ahead. Hopefully, okay. it's, hopefully it's me. Um, but I'm the moderator, so I'm not quite sure how that works. Um, <laughs> um, well, I think, can, do you want us to pull you off of the call and then invite you back in? No, because I'm the moderator, so I think um, I'm, so if, if I get bumped off, I'm, I'm not sure if everybody else will be bumped off either. Um, go ahead and try again, and uh, we'll see what we can do with it afterwards. We'll see um, how it sounds. 
Okay, so okay. I would, should we pick up from where we, we just were? Um, you were you were talking about uh, give, making decisions. Not every decision can be based on a sort of uh, sustainability. You're thinking about climate change. There's a, life's more complex than that. Um, sure. I mean, we we all have lots of lots of different inputs that go into uh, and lots of different outcomes we care about when we make decisions. Um, but we should at least know um, what the effects are of the decisions we're making, um, so that we can thoughtfully engage in those trade-offs. Um, it, to me, that's that's what is the most important characteristic. But that's that's me on a personal level, certainly. Yeah. No. I I think I try to sort of share those values, and I I wonder are we talking about a certain amount of information we're willing to take on board, and, and a certain amount of responsibility for our own actions um, when we're when we're making these decisions. Um, I guess that's. Yeah, yeah, and certainly that's the tricky part, right? The the example is always given. Um, we've got labels on on food about nutrition, um, about uh, where the food is produced. Um, in some places, um, in some pla uh, certainly in, in Western Europe, you have labels um, regarding whether it's produced organically or not, um, or whether there's uh, whether there's genetically modified organisms involved. Um, you have uh, information on uh, whether it's halal or kosher, um, uh, some type of farming that's been used. So at some point, there's an awful lot of information that we have to process in each individual decision. Um, and, and we have to make a choice as to which of those pieces of information we actually um, take in. Um, but I, I think it would be a real shame if those pieces of information were not provided um, for people to have the option of making those decisions. Yeah, yeah, sure. And Rachel, is there anything you'd like to add? Um, not to this part of the conversation. Um, I did want to uh, pick Mark's brain a little bit more, perhaps, um, to go back to the strategizing conversation uh, once yeah. we sign off. Um, so I don't know if we, if you have any. Um, other we, questions that you'd want to ask, or if we should switch to the next? Well, I've, um, I've, should we pause the live chat for the moment? Sure. Yeah, one second. <laughs>